The following is a conversation with world-renowned trainer and coach Broderick Chavez. Broderick is an expert in performance-enhancing drugs, anabolic steroids. He's worked in the industry for 30-plus years in helping IFBB pros, Olympians, uh, etc., work to enhance and, and maximize their performance in their given field through the modalities of drugs, performance-enhancing drugs. He's an absolute expert in it. He has a background in biochemistry, uh, in biology, and a very large degree of experience that, and, and knowledge that has afforded him the title of being one of the world foremost, or at least one of the um, uh, national American experts in this field. And so we talk about all of the pros, potential cons, the risk-benefit analysis of performance-enhancing drugs. We talk about a lot of philosophy more at the start, which uh, Broderick uh, does well to entertain, but definitely uh, doesn't always, I would say, enjoy discussing, but I enjoy discussing. So he humors me in that sense, which I'm grateful for. But where we really get going is uh, around the 30-minute mark, where we really talk about the considerations you need to make around sequencing and prioritizing muscular hypertrophy and programming and the considerations one needs to make uh, when undergoing a cycle and things to look out for if you are going to go on a steroid cycle or an anabolic cycle. And lastly, closing the conversation with something that he doesn't really talk about that much, which you guys will see. I hope this conversation is valuable and you enjoy it with Broderick Chavez. Please also excuse that for the first 10 minutes of the conversation, my audio is not working, but from that point it will be. And so the timestamps and the rough questions that I ask him will be in the description. All right. Bit frazzled to be truthful, but I'll put on a happy face. I'll do my damnedest. Actually, yeah, I'm long story ends with my, my wife has been ill. She's getting over the issues and coming out the other end, but I'm just frazzled. But no, it, it's, it's all right. I mean, it's not, um, not my favorite subject of, of the topic, but um, she was diagnosed with cancer, just went through uh, a surgery and six weeks of chemotherapy. Um, I, I am absolutely not your normal average American, much less you know, European or Australian. I am very atypical. Uh, that said, I'm also, by pedigree, a biologist. And in biology, life cycles are literally what we fucking study. That's the thing. Everything has a progenation and a termination. That, that is not in any way aberrant or unusual or, or exceptional. And so, you know, this idea of, you know, the miracle of life. And that, and no, it's not a fucking miracle. And, and any, any fucking alley cat can make more fucking alley cats. It's not, it's not a miracle. It's just fucking not. Um, the fact that you happen to be conscious enough to think about it makes it vaguely interesting. But beyond that, it's just a biological process. So birth and death to me are just starting and stopping points in the conversation. I, it doesn't really interest, intrigue, or cause me any extra consideration. Well, again, you, you, you have to understand who you're talking to. I'm, I'm emotionally stunted on so many levels. Um, I, I, and I'm completely comfortable saying that out loud. Um, you know, my biggest concern if, I, you know, if my wife had died of cancer is about half the items in the house I couldn't reach. Like that, that's, that was my first concern. So as childish, embarrassing as that is, I, I, that, that was the legitimately the first thought. It's like, how will I get this stuff up there? You know, so again, I'm not the right person to ask those sorts of questions. That's a, that is actually something that I do spend a lot of time thinking about because I am a biologist and, and quite literally, I did not necessarily stop to say I did not. But my consideration was to actually move into evolutionary biology and as postgraduate. Um, so that is actually a topic that I think about hard. And quite honestly, I sincerely think that there's a lot more uh, nature than nurture. Um, there's a lot of, that's the, that's the catchphrase in that conversation is, you know, is it nature, i.e. genetics, or is it nurturing, i.e. environment? And there's actually a lot of studies going all the way back to the, you know, the evil empire of World War II and Dr. Mengele, where they literally rather intentionally separated twins and watched their development. And lo and behold, 
it seems to have a lot more to do with genetics than environment. Environment is a player, but certainly not the, or seemingly not the overriding uh, factor because I wanted to be stronger than everyone else. And that is a biological process. I literally pursued every drop of education that I have purely because I wanted to be a better, stronger, faster athlete. I, I had zero interest in making it a career. I had zero interest in, actually I had zero interest in higher education. It's just that those were the assholes that held the information I wanted. So I had to infiltrate their ranks. In, in my view, that is literally how I, that is actually sort of how I managed to emotionally suffer higher education. Because by, by the way, I despised it. I hated every moment of it in a way that's very hard to describe. But I literally created a, a very almost comic book like world where I was the um, clandestine agent and I was, you know, the, the, the Icarus stealing fire from the gods. And that's how I managed to suffer through that. And their, you know, self-righteous indignation was because I felt like I was pilfering, you know, the, the, the information that I could bring back to my people. Ah, don't ever use that word. I despise that word. Um, well, tr tribalism is infantile. I don't, I don't love that. I don't love that word. Um, the, the whole idea is to move forward and gain information and gain capabilities. We don't want to go backwards to tribalism. I think people that use the word tribe are either just relying on a, a, a catchphrase to get extra clicks and ticks, or they're just actually stupid enough to not know what it really means. Well, I, again, a, a community is a considerably more sophisticated, interactive concept than a tribe. I mean, the whole concept of a tribe is you're insular. That, that, is, that is literally the definition of it. You're insular. In science, you are not supposed to be insular. It's supposed to be a communication. It's supposed to be a transfer of ideas and peer review. And that's not an insular concept. So when you have somebody trying to sell you science and nomenclating themselves as a tribe, they're chock full of shit. You, you didn't ask for this. You didn't solicit this, but I'll just throw this out. Probably from the $100,000 I spent on my education, Probably the single most poignant moment was a very offhanded comment by a professor who said, when you think, you think in language, no matter how mundane the thought, you say, oh, I need to get up and make a sandwich or go to the bathroom or fucking whatever. Words form in your mind. You think in language. Therefore, the width and birth of your language controls the width and birth of your thoughts. If you lack the word, you probably will lack the thought. So language trumps all. If you don't use the proper instrument, you're not going to get the proper measurement. Language controls all. And th this is a very real concept because I have two daughters who are in high school and coming to a close of high school. Um, and I must say with a with, with absolute honesty, it's very difficult, bordering on impossible, bordering on improbable for me to look them in the eyes and say, you must go to college because I'm fully convinced that's a lie. Um, college has utility. <coughs> but I don't think it's a requisite, nor do I think it is a requisite to making a good or capable person. Um, as a matter of fact, I would fall back on, of all people, Frank Zappa. The, the musical genius uh, who said rather flippantly, if you want an education, go to the library. If you want to get laid, go to university. Um, and I think that's pretty relevant to the world we live in. Now, there are certain vocations where a university education could give you the groundwork. I think very much like myself, pursuing you know, life sciences and general biology gave me a groundwork, dare I say, not to put pun upon pun, but the language necessary to learn the things that I actually wanted to know. And the comedy is, I didn't even know the things that I, I didn't know what I wanted to know until I possessed that fucking language. I thought I was going to go to university and steal away with these actual things. The reality is, I left the university with the tools to then spend the rest of my fucking life finding the things that I actually wanted. 100%.
the greatest tool that I wield is frustration. The only reason I still do this is every fucking morning I wake up and I am frustrated about my ineptitude in a given topic. And I break a book open and I fucking learn. Frustration is the driving force for me to be better. It's not income. It's not being a better coach. It's not being touchy-feely. It's not even selling memberships on my website. It's goddamned, unrelenting, unyielding frustration. I'm just a single-minded, dogmatic asshole that wants to figure this shit out. I want it done. I, I just I don't quite want to leave this earth until I can say that, all right, that's fucking done. Here, have it. Here's the book. Actually, my, my grandfather. My grandfather was a pro wrestler in the 50s and 60s. Um, have you have you heard the name Gorgeous George? Pretty famous name. Um, my my grandfather was not he, but my my grandfather was um, one of the the heels that followed him around the country and was the consistent loser to him. He was a, a what what's called a road partner. Um, they certainly had an influence. Quite honestly, the the, the pivotal moment I, I remember it like it was literally. I, I even just thinking of it just casually you now. The hair on my arm stands up. Um, quite literally, the pivotal moment was um, I, I, I had a very odd childhood. And one of the reasons why I don't like to talk about this shit is my childhood's so fucked up and atypical that it's awkward to talk about. But I, I had no television. I was not exposed to television like other humans were. Um, and I would go to my grandmother's house a day or so a week, and I would get a few minutes alone with a television. It was really fascinating. It was high technology. It was really interesting. And um, a- anyway, I remember sitting cross-legged in her living room floor and the wide world of sports it used to be kind of a, the prototype to ESPN. It was like a, a serial show that showed like minutes of assorted sports, like the kind of like what's happening in sports today kind of thing. And it showed some footage of the 1972 um, Olympics in weightlifting. And that was a really, really thick crowd. It was Vasily Alexia, uh, Ken Patera, Serge Redding, like really the who's who of Olympic lifting. And there's this you know, room full of people cheering and there's these guys walking up on stage and lifting a barbell. And I, I, I literally stopped what I was doing and I ran to the nearest adult and I, I said, that's a job? Like that, that's a, th- people do that? That's a job? And they're like, well, they're professional athletes. I said, professional, that's a job. Fuck, that is the coolest job in the world. I want to do that. That was literally the pivotal moment. Like I was, I had no idea that there was a career path that involved barbells. I didn't, I had no idea that that was a thing. And that was probably, I was probably six or seven years old. And literally from that day forward, my question was, when, when can I go to the gym and start my career? Like, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm missing out. This is the perfect point where I should probably do my marketing whoring. Um, but, but for a reason, it's actually relevant to your question. O- on my members' website, actually, probably the most marquee bit of information I have is something that I refer to as the practical application series, which is just that, a series of videos that leads you through that exact series of thoughts. Why are you thinking about drugs? What should you really be thinking about? Is, are drug, is drug use for you? What are the risk rewards? What are the things you need to look for? What are the, those sorts of questions? Because I think too many people start with the, what should I take? And not the evaluation of, should I even take? Which I think is a far more relevant concept because it's a little bit like losing one's virginity. You, you really don't get a redo. The reality is I don't give one fuck about someone's reasoning um, as I don't think they should give much care about mine. What I would say is acquiring the necessary education, just simply know what you are paying for your actions. That's the real reality is I don't care why you're doing it. Simply be aware of the actual cost of that act. Okay. You know, it, it literally the same as breaking the law. Like theoretically you're not supposed to break the law, but there are people out there that are blatantly willing to do that for the potential return on their actions. I'm okay with that. Just simply be aware of the cost you will incur okay. or, or even theoretically could incur. So what are the theoretical could incur costs that more people should be aware of that we need to be aware of before doing something like that? 
Well, here again, you, you know, you use the word PED and the reality is that's the correct language, but it's, it's the problem is that's such a yeah. staggeringly broad yeah. pantheon of things in this world. You know, in the 1960s, PEDs were basically testosterone and anabolic steroids. And that was what it was. And then it expanded into, you know, beta adrenergics and antiestrogens. And then it moved into insulin and growth hormone. And, you know, now there's literally probably not a drug in the pharmacopoeia pantheon that isn't in some way applicable to sports. So in a way, PED is pretty much just any drug you could fucking name depending on the sport, depending on the individual, depending on the need. So I'm guessing most of this conversation is revolving around the kind of beginner area that is testosterone, anabolic steroids, maybe growth hormone. So I'll momentarily limit my conversation to that. But the reality is that's by no means the beginning nor end of the conversation. And there are sports out there that comically steroids don't really help. There are, there are sports out there that for instance, you know, um, Beta blockers are the necessary tools. Mm. Uh, there are sports out there that, again, um, you know, n- nootropics and learning agents. You know, there are people now failing drug tests in chess tournaments. So, um, again, though, you got to be very careful about the language and what it exactly you're talking about. But when it comes to steroids, the real insidious problem is that they work so fucking well and that they're actually as safe as they are. That's the actual insidious danger um, because <clears throat> mortality and, and, and even just the long-term health decrements that could ultimately lead to mortality are very incremental. They're very, very small and they're accrued very, very slowly. And if you're taking a drug that works like magic and seemingly has little to no side effects, it's very easy for cardiac plaque, atherosclerosis, loss of insulin sensitivity, for these things to very incrementally build up in the background and lead you to a very catastrophic problem far in the future, like your governments run their economies. As long as everything's okay now, then everything's okay, except that day when the bill comes due. Now, should how do we cap the downside of the bill coming in? Um... One, probably have realistic goals and have the good judgment to stop when stopping is appropriate. And then secondly, the, the, the thing that nobody really wants to do, especially people that are moving toward drugs at a very young and early age, and I will give myself an exception to that, but I'll explain the exception, and that is do the work, do the necessary exorbitant amount of cardiovascular exercise that's necessary to counterbalance the cardiac implications. Do the necessary diligence to eat a low fat, relatively speaking, low cholesterol diet. Do all of those things that are literally difficult. Most people are eyeing drugs to make their life easier, not harder. What are the cardiovascular... Go ahead, Roger. Well, I was going to say, you know, giving myself... the. The, 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 the pass on that is actually because I was actually coached by you know, some very, very, very high-end people at the time, Dr. Fred Hatfield and Tom Platts and Tom Dieters and some of these people. And they coached me to, to have the mindset of drugs are not going to make your life easier. Drugs are going to make your life harder. You're, you're taking a commitment. By doing these things, you now have to take on a part-time job of cardiovascular exercise and you have to be three times more diligent about your diet and three times more diligent about your training. So I was brought into this mix with the mindset of taking the leap to drugs was a, a, a leap of commitment in terms of workload and, and, and ethics, not a, Oh, this will get me to my goals faster. It was fuck. This is going to triple my workload. Because you have to be more diligent about your diet, more diligent about your cardiovascular activity, um, more diligent about your blood work. Of course, and again, even you know, again, I'm you know, being natural. You know, whether you are or at some point in your life you were, um, you're you're limited in the amount of training you do by your naturalosity. Yeah. Like being natural gives you a distinct cap in how much volume you can do. Well, drugs fucking change that. 
So now literally just the amount of work I need to do in the gym to live up to my dosage is vastly elevated. So when I say your workload triples, I'm not joking. Your workload triples. I, I get this selfish, you know, self-righteous indignation from naturals. You know, why don't you just do it the natural way? Because there is no natural way to do what I do. Doing 10 sets of 10 with double your body weight is not a natural possibility. It's a separate species. I, and again, I don't say that as a brag. I simply say that as a, as a, a, a statement of fact. That's a, a, a factual admission in court. It just does not exist. So you elevate the, dramatically the potential of what the human organism is capable of. Uh, how much do you think, if you could put like a quantifiable multiplier on how much you believe it increases the strength hypertrophy, it's a general question. Like how much do you generally expect like a multiplier on your own work capacity and output? From, ju from just steroids, uh, well, anabolics. Well, let, let's let, let, let's start with some basic kind of bedrock facts that we can agree on or, or should be able to agree on. Because if you talk to like the, uh, the IWF assholes, they consistently throw out 10%. Like, oh, you know, it's, it's well known that steroids improve performance by 10%. Uh, that's a fucking lie. That's just a lie upon lie upon lie. For instance, let's dial back the hands of time to the 1920s, give or take, when people did lift weights and, you know, reasonably hard and reasonably organized. What was the most massive human being on earth in the 1920s? 200 pounds? Maybe. 220 pounds? Maybe. Okay. We have people well into the 400s today. So you tell me, what is the multiplier? Pretty straightforward, you know, in, in, you know, envelope napkin mathematics. You know, it's pretty straight fucking forward. Now, strength is a little bit of a different answer because strength, yeah, has more to do with leverages and specific techniques and things other than just outright mass. But even then, consider this. The 400-pound bench press did not exist on planet Earth previous to drugs. That's an interesting concept. And we could probably say a similar thing about deadlifts and squats and major feats of strength that are occurring. Yep. Uh, like yep. thousand pound squats and deadlifts um, that we're seeing uh, by, by Chris Duffin. Uh, yeah, again, you know, you're not to throw any one individual under the bus, just, just look at it in a timeline concept. The double body weight bench press didn't exist un un until the era of drugs. It's suspicious. It might one lead one to conclude that drugs were responsible um, you know, that's correlation, not absolute causality, but pretty likely. But in exchange for that, you know, you get an enhanced quality of life. I know you, I believe you value that highly, but how much do you think you, you take off the bottom end? You know, I don't know if you can quantify it. I don't know if we have longitudinal studies of testosterone or over a lifetime, even though it's been studied for a long time. Do we have accurate data or evidence or at least mechanistic evidence indicating how much we could take off the, the tail end of a life over decades of use? Well, no, we, we, we really don't have those studies. But what we do have studies, it shows that body weight, body weight is the leading indicator of mortality across almost all mammalian species, the larger the individual of that species, the shorter the lifespan. We, we, we have that data. Yep. Um, there's some weird outliers, fucking sea lions and some goofy shit. But in a general sense, among people, the largest ones die the youngest and smallest ones tend to live the longest. That, that, we, we have that data. Um, so you're talking about drugs that increase lean mass, even among the longevity assholes, it increases lean mass. Lean mass is, well, fucking mass. Physics is physics. Mass is mass. Mass means weight on a scale unless you momentarily weigh yourself on some other fucking planet. So 
you can come to the reasonable conclusion that these drugs are going to have impact on longevity and mortality because they're moving the prime indicator of mortality. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you- it, it, that, that, the reason that causes so everyone's anus to suck up so tight and make that whistling noise is because that's logic and it's really hard to refute. It's a cost, but there's also an exchange you get in, in return. Have you- right. Now, again, I'm not bashing it. Even among the longevity assholes who really do cause me angst, they're getting additional utility. They are more capable in their later years. They're paying for that capability with additional body weight, which is almost certainly costing them some longevity, despite the nomenclature. They think if they change the name, they can outsmart the biology, but that, that doesn't actually work, but they are more capable. Yes. They get more boners into their seventies. They have more, you know, hip thrusting power in their seventies. Yes. It, it, it does that, but the cost is muscle mass, which is going to drive that. And that muscle mass is going to put a burden on their cardiac and renal systems and therefore impact mortality. Okay. The, great. This is what I want to kind of dive into more. Um, specifically, what are the cardiovascular implications? Do you do we have? It's tough, I know, but do we have evidence to show us how much it increases the risk of uh, atherosclerosis? For example, um, do you have anecdote that you generally see? Well, we can typically expect to see this multiply by this much. No, all all I can offer you is having a larger escalated body weight is almost guaranteed to impact into some degree sure. left ventricular hypertrophy. Yep. That's e- even among people that don't use drugs, that's an outcome. So we know that. So factor that in. Now, what does that actually cost? I don't fucking know, but it does. We know almost you know universally that androgen use impacts both positively and negatively, but usually negatively, LDL, HDL r- ratio. Also, HDL, LDL particle size. Also, likely vascular inflammation. So we we know these things. In a general sense, we know these things are bad. But do we know precisely and exactly? No, not even sort of. Yeah, I appreciate that because you know how many so many people will try and bullshit that answer or at least come up with some type of figure and sell people on it. Like, so, thank you. Um. (laughs) Then how do we, what's the best way, or actually, what are the main pillars to ameliorate those potential side effects or reduction or increases in mortality and morbidity and disease? Uh, you, we talk about cardio, cardiovascular activity to help ameliorate some of those uh, risks. How, how much, what's the dosage, what's the kind of the confidence interval for, for that specific intervention? <sighs> See, now you're getting into an area where there are other people that are better suited to answering you because okay. that answer comes with a certain amount of happy-go-lucky, touchy-feely, I actually care about your well-being. And I'm going to be honest, that's not me. I spend all of my days and all of my hours and all of my days trying to find the, the optimal outcome for performance. And unfortunately, the ultimate outcome for performance is usually pretty contraindicatory yes. to longevity and overall mortality. Yes. So what I'm trying to do is figure out how much of these variables do we need to counterbalance, but yet not interfere or override yes. the thing we're actually trying to do, That's which what I isn't know. the same as I want to be ultimately healthy. You know, when people do that, you know, what's the optimal this to make me healthy? I'm like, fucking eat watercress, drink spring water, and never talk to me. That's the correct answer. But you're not doing that, so fuck you. So what are those variables you're taking into consideration? Um, again, cardiovascular exercise we know has improving, has capacity to improve lipid profile, total body fat percentage, blood pressure, Cardi- uh, uh, insulin sensitivity. So we're individually measuring those things and we're kind of you know, dose correcting, you know, when one of those vac- factors gets worse, we implement perhaps more of a certain variety okay. of cardiovascular exercise to try and compensate for it. But every time we do that, that then interferes with our outcomes of 
you know, skeletal protein expression, performance, neurology, whatever. And now we have to juggle in variable. There's times when we just simply have to, as athletes, we simply have to take a hit to our health. There's no way to be optimally capable on a platform, a field of play or whatever, and deal with these other variables. So now it just becomes, again, another, another risk reward analysis. How important is this event versus these va- variables on blood work? And you make decisions. Absolutely. Okay. So cardiovascular uh, activity, you mentioned for those reasons. Uh, I know you have a preference of a low fat Correct. diet as well, which can then have implications, particularly, particularly of saturated fat to lipid markers. Agreed. Are there any other justifications you give for a lower fat intervention? Um, would you... could? Would you recommend or how would you consider somebody do even a ketogenic or a high fat carnivore-esque diet in the context of muscle building anabolics? I wouldn't. I just, you know, I mean, again, as a biologist, I can pontificate on the wonders, adaptability and variability of human capabilities. As Pythicans, the reason we have survived ice ages and all of the global turmoil and predators and all the things is not because we're particularly fast or strong or have scales or claws or any of that shit. It's because we have a very wide width and birth of dietary survivability. Mm. That, that is the thing. Humans exist on almost every corner of this planet and most foods do not. We have a wide, wide capability of metabolic survivability. I'm, I'm completely capable of leading you through all of those pathways. We, we have that. But to then try and take that absurdity and morph it into, and all of them are equally applicable to optimal sports performance, that's asinine. So again, my answer to you would be, I wouldn't. I would just simply, if if someone came before me committed to those ideas, I would say, go seek someone who is willing to placate to your thoughts and ideas because I will not. You are wrong. I am right. Go Again, go fuck yourself. No. That that is that that phrase has come out of my mouth many a times to many prominent people. I, I just I don't I don't have a temperament for that. I'm not gonna lie to you so you can pay me. That that's not gonna happen. Okay. Because you like you have a tried and true history of science and experience that you know what shit works. Yeah, yeah, I mean uh, yeah. That's it. Like, that's <laughs> and it. you you asked you, you asked the question that I, I did skip over, and I apologize. Um, you, you, you mentioned about you know, me having a preference for low fat diet yeah. and its implications on you know car- potential cardiovascular health and lipid health, yeah. which, which it does. Yeah. But it also brings a number of other really, in my opinion, sexy and useful utilities. Like for every gram of fat you don't eat, you get to eat something cool, like I don't know, carbohydrates, which are delicious accessible, full of energy, usually full of nutrition, micronutrition, fiber, another thing that has an impact on the lipid profile. And it also generates this horrible, evil, wretched stuff called insulin, which happens to be one of the most anabolic hormones in human biology. So if you gave me the choice between these three sources of food and one generated an anabolic response and the other two did not which one am i going to preferentially graduate gravitate toward oh that's a bit of an easy question yeah no shit like that's the one if you want to optimize even that word is shit i know you don't like that word if you want to take the path of maximal growth and performance that appears to be the smartest path yep that, that would be my position all fucking day long. <laughs> Has been for about two decades. Right. Okay. Cool. You've actually done, I, I won't belabor that point because you've done great podcasts on that, okay, that people can go watch. You've talked about it for at nauseum. Um, but with yeah. this. And Steve Hall still calls and asks me to repeat myself. Well, <laughs> I won't. Okay. That's done. Uh, <laughs> lipids, low fat, cardiovascular. Are there any other main variables? Soluble fiber. 
soluble fiber is a very big mover in keeping blood lipid profile under control, possibly the biggest mover in human nutrition, to be honest. Do you want, are you able to talk about the mechanism of how that uh, displaces some of the absorption of cholesterol for people who are unaware? Um, yeah, again, what most people don't realize is most of the cholesterol in your bloodstream is actually manufactured by your liver. It's not dietary in nature. Um, when cholesterol makes it to through the stomach and into the uh, beginning of the intestinal tract, um, there, there's a, a, a process at the portal vein called bile reuptake. Bile is released by your gallbladder and liver into that region, and it basically emulsifies said fats and is reuptaken through the portal vein back into the liver. Cholesterol, fatty acids and cholesterol, are actually such valuable material to the body that it has a built-in recycling method to prevent that from being lost to digestion. That's how relevant and important this stuff is. It's also why you don't need to provide gobs of it through fucking nutrition is because your body is that careful to not waste it. Big relevant point there. Um, so what happens is um, actually the same process by which soap is made. It's actually a process called soponification. Um, uh, uh, soluble fiber basically in, in very, very layman's terms, basically gums up the works encapsulates said lipid globules, making it inaccessible in this gum base matrix, making it inaccessible to the bile. So the bile reuptake does not take place. And that cholesterol is in a sense wasted or moved down into the digestive tract and actually processed as basic fatty acids rather than recycled as the valuable commodity in which it is. So by that process, if you eat a low fat, low cholesterol diet, your liver actually loses net cholesterol to the process rather than reuptaking it and being in equilibrium or even in a positive uh, state. Okay. Hence, fiber playing its role in that reuptake and controlling mm, lipid Correct. markers. Cool. Correct. Do you have a relative amount of fiber or an absolute amount of fiber you'd like to look at per kilogram of body weight? Or I did. I, I wrote... To, to, be a, to be a sarcastic ass, I literally wrote a nutrition book on sticky notes. Not a joke. It's true. Um, and in that, you know, there's a sticky note on a page with some surrounding information. It's not wholly on sticky notes, but the, the relevant bullet point concepts are, in fact, on sticky notes. That's the, that was the point of the book. And on, in said book, I suggest 30 total grams of dietary fiber and, roughly speaking, um, 10 or greater of that being soluble fiber. Great. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's pretty much on the money pretty with the standard. recommended daily intake, at least in Australia. Pretty standard. Correct. And again, you know, again, you know, I went to the trouble of writing a book and to be honest, I honestly didn't really want to write a book because there's not a lot in there that's groundbreaking. Most of it is in fact, the pretty standard established stuff because a hundred years of science has pretty much narrowed this shit down to a fine edge. There's not a lot of, you know, wildly new anythings. We're the same species. These are the same foods. There's not a lot of difference. Yet people seem to always want to sell you on. They've found these new principles or new science that has changed the whole fabric of biology so they can make money right. and build a whatever. And Right. And it's just not and when you stop. I mean, even if you knew nothing about the topic, if you just step back and think about that, people have been eating since there's people. We don't have this worked out like that. That just doesn't seem even remotely possible that we don't know how to eat like we that it's, it's, it's pretty well. It's pretty well established shit or that we only ate one food group forever. <laughs> like, well, even that's ridiculous, like the paleo asshole. Yeah, g g gather up a room full of paleo assholes and all the shit that they mention that's so greatly paleo didn't fucking exist in the Paleolithic era. Right. Ninety nine out of a hundred foods that we eat today bear zero resemblance to what they did in the Paleolithic era via hybridization and God forbid evil genetic engineering. Um, none of the foods we eat uh, 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 ten thousand years ago, cabbages were poisoned. Literally, cabbages contain poisonous you know, toxins that have been bred out by human, by humans. 
You know, oh yeah. You know, a, a mere three or 4,000 years ago, bananas had great big seeds in them the size of fucking coins. Mm. We bred them out of them. That nothing's similar. All the shit people love to love has nothing to do with what it originally was. Right. And so that's the, that's the nature of this. Uh, like, there's going to be constant change in funny word, funny word to use, but oh, yeah, na- right. yeah, yeah, it is. That's I don't know what type of irony that is, um, but at least it seems to be the nature of human beings to constantly change our environment or and adapt through it. And um, but at well, least- again, that's our that's our capability that we have yeah. thumbs, a funny curve in our spine, and thumbs, which allows us to be upright to use our fucking thumbs. That's our that's our magic. The ability to manipulate her environment is why we're here. You know, it's certainly not because we can run fast or, you know, fucking you know, catch shit. No, we're not even it's that because strong. we can manipulate our environment. Like chimpanzees and gorillas are like wildly stronger than us per pound of body weight. Correct. Like, I think we give ourselves a little too much credit sometimes, but uh, at least I like, the, I like the homo sapiens species anyway. We're, we're all right sometimes anyway. But I guess. Uh, <laughs> let's okay. Li- uh, fiber, uh, low fat, uh, cardiovascular. Are there any other main mm-hmm. pillars you want to mention in regards to considerations for PEDs anabolics? Um, controlling blood pressure, which usually begins with you know a moderate to low level of body fat and a moderate to low level of overall water retention. Um, those have very, very big implications on mortality and overall you know, survivability of drug use. Um, again, stop and think about this. Think about athletes that have legitimately been sidelined from sports. It's number one is orthopedic injuries. Okay, that aside, how many can you think of that have gone out from liver dysfunction? That's a real short list. Like you could carry, you could drive all of those people to, you know, to the, to, to the store on Sunday. It's a very small number. Cardiovascular, much bigger, but bigger yet, renal dysfunction. Most athletes that go out, it's, it's kidney. It's long-term hypertension, blood pressure, kidney damage. They're out of sports. Renal, renal dysfunction is the number one evil. So controlling blood pressure is pretty fucking important. And by the way, that also falls under the cardiovascular side, but also in moderating total body fat percentage and total blood pressure via nutritional mechanisms and others. Do you uh, have a, a, a range you like to stay within for blood pressure? Um, I, again, I'm not breaking any new ground here. The, the 120 over 80 that's been the universal standard since the dawn of medicine is a very good target. Also a very improbable, difficult target as one gets bigger. Yeah. The only answer I would offer you there is regardless of what you are at, lower is almost always better. So strive for lower. And if you're getting into the, say, you know, 140, 90 range, it may be time for pharmacological intervention, though I don't love that answer. It may, in fact, be necessary. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of your upper limit that you're like, okay, let's peel it back. Let's look at some interventions. Okay. 140 over 90. Um, before you talked about uh, blood pressure, you talked about, ah, that's a kidneys. Um, looking at blood markers uh, is something you, you really should be monitoring pretty carefully, but also relies on an underpinning of biochemistry and physiology mm-hmm. and uh, energy metabolism, which most people don't mm-hmm. understand. So when you look at, kidney function what markers are you looking out for uh maybe even ranges if you're comfortable speaking about them from gfr to uh potassium sodium electrolyte balance uh what are some red flags or some ranges you like to stay within um well i would definitely your blood work is kind of the top tier of this but even before blood work i would look at just overall edema and water retention you know it, it, do your socks generate a line on your leg? Simple yet childish yet incredibly relevant things. You know, do you have full digital you know dexterity? Do you, you know, does your ring come off your finger? Stuff like that. Let's start there cool, cool. because you can have significant edema and water retention without some people without showing you know, measurable increases in blood pressure or even a degradation in EGFR. Just know that. It's coming. It just ain't got there yet. So 
that's a really easy starting point is just, are you edemic? That's a great place to begin. Then moving into blood work, I would say the most relevant and kind of universally accessible measurement would be EGFR. And again, it's one of those things where I'm not here to say, oh, at 60, 50, 40, you have to stop. All I would offer you is the larger that number is, the longer the runway you have. And the smaller that number is, the smaller the runway you have in which to land this fun. So use that information as you will. Can you, for those who are unaware, can you talk about briefly what glomerular filtration rate is and what it tells us? Um, it ba basically, your kidneys are a filter. It's an incredibly generic and kind of childlike thing. But literally, think of a coffee filter. And if you hold it up to the light, you can see through it. And the less light you can see through it, the more the less porous and the more filtery it's going to be. And the more light that it lets through, the more porous and the more particulate matter that will get through it. Literally, if you make coffee in the morning, one morning, try this. Make coffee with two coffee filters. You get a considerably different cup at the end of that because it's more filtered. That's literally the problem. Yeah, that, that's, that's kidneys in a nutshell. Um, now, admittedly, they work in this layered process and there's little tubules in between. And, but the moral of the story is it's a filter. What that measurement is, is a mathematical amalgam of different quotients that ultimately amounts to basically how much material is passing through your, particulate materials passing through your kidneys. And the smaller that number, the less effective as a filter your kidneys are. And so what is the potential burden, not potential, what is the burden that anabolics, what is the, even the mechanism that anabolics can uh, place on the kidneys? Like, obviously there's more particulates to filter through, but is a greater detail you could go into explaining that? Well, well an anabolic steroids have big influences on how your body compartmentalizes fluid. They, you know, there, there's, <laughs> there's this goofy mindset in bodybuilding that there are certain steroids that, you know, cause you to get dry, that, that's retarded. All androgens cause a measure of water retention. The reality is the dry ones simply cause considerably less retention than the more osmotic. But at the end of the day, all cause more water retention than a non-androgenic state, period, end of story. There is no real debate on that other than the bro science observation of, oh, well, when I take Winstrol, I seem to look better than when I take Anadrol. Well, okay. The way that anabolic steroids do this largely is by manipulating ion gradients. They change the osmotic pressures within and without a cell, causing a greater likelihood for water to be stored inside the cell than outside. It causes uh, cellular hydration. That cellular hyd hydration influences ion ratios. Those ion ratios plus the additional pressures then have downstream effects on the kidney both in the amount of ions, sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, they get to the kidneys and need to be filtered, and the sheer amount of fluid and the pressure behind it said fluid. Okay. Therefore, looking at your electrolyte status, particularly a high electrolyte status, could be indicative as a, and a proxy for how much of those solutes you're having to be filtered through the kidneys? Correct, but in the same breath, they're also a good proxy of, and the drugs are doing basically what I'm paying for, okay. which is causing right. that ion shit. Got it. Is there a, an upper limit that you, you like to stick within for those electrolytes? Usually the only real upper limit I would put there is potassium in that if potassium gets into the yeah, eight plus milli equivalent range, you're going to start to have nervous dysfunction. You're going to have an irregular heartbeat, muscle cramps, and you know, fucking legitimate problems. Um, okay. But beyond that, no, I really don't like to put numbers because, again, your genetic predisposition, e even age, race, even age, sex, and race has an impact on what those numbers are anyway. Yeah. And then the specific drug and the specific dosage are going to have significant impacts on that. So, no, it's very hard to just throw out a number because there could be a context where that's the right number, even Absolutely. though it's wrong most of the time. Absolutely. Okay. In, in the realm of obvious, obviously, I don't know, how does the conversation of supplementation then change as you start an anabolic, anabolic cycle? Because you could use supplements to ameliorate some of the potential side effects. Uh, 
and the burdens that anabolics are putting on the system. But in the same vein, obviously you probably don't need to take supplemental creatine because the muscle is being saturated with so much, uh, being hydrated and saturated with so much fluid anyway. But that's kind of another conversation. Well, one of the big effects. One of the big effects of androgens is an upregulation or a hypermanufacture of the creatine synthase enzyme anyway. Right. Therefore, your cells are making their own creatine. So you don't need it. But in that case, how would you think about supplementation in general for curbing some of the side effects or even enhancing some of the performance of well, the Well, that's the really where that, that, that latter part is really where my mind goes. Yeah. I don't love the idea of trying to spot fix problems. Uh, I think oftentimes that makes problems that you're unaware of and also hides potential, the, the severity of some potential outcomes. Um, for instance, there's a really big uh, push in the supplement, o OTC supplement industry to come up with um, you know, liver preservatives, something that improves liver health. Um, and one, that seems like a fool's errand, but two, even if they did work and for instance, using product X, Y, or Z, your liver enzymes were lower than if you didn't use it. Let, let's say that product exists, although I'm highly suspicious, but let, let's just say it did. My question would be this, why do your liver enzymes go up? What is the mechanistic series of events that's going on there? Your liver enzymes go up to dismantle potentially harmful drugs. That's what they're doing. That sounds important. And not having that happen mm. also sounds important. Right. So again, just because you can do something doesn't necessarily make it a positive. I think this is such a great point because usually there's a lot of practitioners and I've probably done this mistakenly in the past where you see a marker and you, you miss out on the context. Doesn't mean you should improve it or reduce it. The context of the individual and other correlations are important. Correct. I'll give you an example that's very near and dear to me. Again, as we mentioned, I don't know if we were recording when I mentioned this, but my wife just re recently went through a bout of cancer and people contacted me, you know, very, you know, very, um, I I'm very appreciative of the fact that they took the time to reach out and they made recommendations like, oh, during chemotherapy, take, you know, nine grams of vitamin C and two, you know, this much glutathione and, and this much this. fast and as well. Well, uh, yeah, but, but, you know, all of these sort of antioxidant preservative type mechanisms. Okay. And that's completely contraindicatory to what we're trying to do. The whole idea of chemotherapy is you are poisoning yourself. The bet you're making is the cancer will die before you. That's literally the fundamentals of what's going on. So that's much like taking the venom and the anti-venom at the same time. Why would you do that? If the goal is to expedite poisoning of the system, you don't take the anti-venom. The tough thing is, unfortunately, with these therapies, you're killing healthy cells as well. Agreed. But the idea is you have more and more robust healthy cells than you have cancer. That's literally the bet. That's what chemotherapy is. Right. So trying to take you know, antioxidants to ameliorate the process that you're trying to in instigate I see. is not a good out that's not that's not the idea and the 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 interesting thing is it's like okay can we have both it appears no. like well <laughs> in that context only in the context of therapies of, of cancer it appears like fasting sensitizes cancer cells to death and desensitizes healthy cells uh to dying um that's the only evidence i've seen of of that occurring um which may implicate it to be beneficial I'm not sure if you've seen that. I, I, I've seen those studies and many others. And quite honestly, I don't put a lot of stock in them. I don't put a lot of interest in them. And, you know, even with, you know, cancer having worked its way into my life, it's still not particularly interesting or exciting. Uh, again, it's kind of like the studies that show like hyper low calories, hyper low calorie diets improve longevity. Yeah, by any anyone knows that. If you buy a new car and you don't drive it much, it lasts for fucking ever. Yeah. But you know what? You don't go anywhere either. Yes. So what the fuck's the point in having the new car? So again, I don't buy into those sorts of studies because the context, when you really look at the real world application of that context, it's just, it has none. And I, 
I think that point on the longevity kind of guys and girls where they'll, they'll preach like I can live a long time to 110, whatever, but the quality of life, you can't lift weights. You're not strong. You can't get, well, you can't really like that doesn't sound valuable to me or I don't know, to most people. I, I would tend to agree, but nonetheless, it's again, it's just the whole, you know, er everything has a context, everything has a perspective. And I, it, and then on top of that, I'm so skewed from childhood. Like it just, it just, it's not relevant to me. Yeah. And people are consistently amazed when they you know, get in front of me and start bringing up things in conversation. They're, they're amazed at the things that I'm so dismissive of. I'm just like, I, I just don't care. I don't, I haven't studied that. I don't care. And they're, they're so confused by that, but, Again, as I said, almost all of my education is predicated on the point of I wanted to know that for a selfish reason. I wanted to know that because I thought it might make me better at what I do. Mm. And none of that other shit falls into that category. So I only know about it peripherally because I just don't give a f not. I mean, literally not not one fuck. That saves you energy and saves you time. You focus on the shit that matters to you. Um, there's a guy. There's a, a guy. I, w I wish I was better. I wish I was. A, I sincerely wish I was a better person, and I could actually take the time to like remember a name and a face and actually put people to deeds. But there, there's a, a guy, a black guy, uh, had a, uh, what sounded like an American accent, but I truly don't know. Um, sent, I sent me a video, and I don't know if he made it for me. But he said it directly to me, and it, it really uh, struck home. And I post it regularly on my Instagram stories. Um, he's, he, you know, this very, very good-looking black guy, and this little kind of, you know, kind of like hipster little outfit. And uh, really Shakespearean. He turns the camera, and there's this big empty field, and he says, "Behold, the field in which I farm my fucks." Notice that it is barren, for I have no more fucks to give. And it's just, as soon as I saw it, I was just like, Fuck that's, you. that's my fucking theme song. That is the best thing I've ever seen. Broderick, if that isn't made for you, I don't know what is. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's, I mean, you should make one like that. It that's really perfect. is. And I <laughs> I'm really astounded. Like, I watch your podcast, and I'm like, you are like I'm really impressed by how unbashfully you, like comfortable you are, not caring. Like, do you know? Like that is so uncommon. Do you know how many people like care about other people's opinions? Like I'm like this guy doesn't get really like you know how people say they don't care, but they really kind of do. Like you really seem like you yeah. don't give a fuck. No, I, I super don't. I, it it is it is almost certainly a legitimate variety of mental illness. It's no, but it's not like. You know, it's not probably something that's desirable. It legitimately is probably a pathology. But the, the honest truth is, the, whatever genes in your mind worry about religion and or what other people think, mine are defective because I just don't give a fuck. I, as a matter of fact, I don't give a fuck on such a level that I can't even conceive of giving a fuck. <laughs> it's, that's brilliant. That's, yeah. You can't even conceive of it. That's hilarious. Um, I I don't know you, obviously, but I would put, it seems like genetics and some shit that happened to you in childhood really coalesced to create that. I, I, I would suspect. I would suspect. Um, but I, it, it, may, it seems like a bit of a superpower as well. Like a mental illness maybe can be a bit of a superpower. You know, you say Yeah, time. like insomnia. Yeah, I, I tell myself that every day. <laughs> Just... Just keep telling yourself that, Broderick. It's uh that's one way to deal with it. Um Okay. Speaking of not giving a fuck, we were talking about PEDs and the considerations uh -huh. we need to make. I think we really rounded out and we had we, we mentioned a lot of really good important points. Um I wondering in the now to kind of shift gears a little bit. This is an important question that I wanted to ask. You know, I wonder how you prioritize and sequence different styles of training to build different components of muscle growth. E.g., mechanical tension work is good for myofibrillar growth, high rep work, good for pillarization and sarcoplasmic growth, metabolic training, good for mitochondrial capacity. 
how do you consider the sequence of your different styles of training to build these different components of muscle growth? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, on my member site, there's a uh, course. I don't really like that language because it's not a course. It's a series of seminars I did. Um, to me, a course kind of culminates in some sort of a test and some sort of accreditation, which I don't fucking offer. But nonetheless, the people who made my website chose to nomenclate it as a course. So fair play. Um, I did it in Australia, interestingly, um, Sydney, um, called the Vectors of Sports Performance. And what you're asking is what I was trying, and not 100% successfully, but trying to intimate in that every trait has an accretion and recession, an accretion, retention, and recession time. And by understanding those, you can organize your training. And by the way, it's not always the same organization because the outcome ultimately determines everything. But you know, if the outcome is throwing a hammer or performing a max squat or looking a certain way on a bodybuilding stage, that's a series, a coalition, coalition of traits. You then backward engineer, how long does each one of those traits last if you stop training it and that gives you the end point then how long must you train to maintain it that gives you a midpoint and then how, what is the accretion time to get it and that gives you a starting point and so then you know the time you start each of those things to get them all to be at their peak transmutability on day of okay that makes sense it does make sense but then it makes me think well, where's the best place to start for enhanced <laughs> and non-enhanced? Well, number one big giant bullet point, draw a big red circle around it with a lot of arrows. I haven't a fucking clue about unenhanced because I don't care. Okay, That's, that's just basic fundamental information everyone needs to know. Um, I could fake my way through it based on what I know about life sciences, but I'm just not sufficiently interested in it to do so so don't ask me natural questions because i don't care done but L so, lyle, they could go to lyle my, mcdonald if they want to hear that right 100 percent. go to lyle mcdonald uh, which and and by the way it, comically you would ask this question actually i was just i'm very privileged in that when i call lyle he actually answers which is an amazingly rare thing um i'm probably the only human in the known universe who has both Mike Isertel and Lyle McDonald on speed dial, and they'll both answer. Um, Pretty sweet. You got a good network. But I was, you. A good I was speaking. I was speaking with Lyle just the other day, and we actually talked about the concept of writing a training book predicated on that: how to optimize training styles to specific traits, and then how to pharmacologically enhance the process. Um, we we literally just had that conversation not a, not a week ago. Um, so you asked, how do you start the process? And the answer is actually exactly that. You start the process at the end point and you work everything backward. Why? And what's that the is, end point? Well, the end point is whatever the end point is. Like oh, the there goal. is a uh, there is a contest. Got it. So okay, that's the that's the target. And the way you think about this intellectually is if you had an assortment of arrows that were all different lengths and weights, you would need to position yourself at different points to be able to draw the bow fully and get each one of those arrows to hit the same bullseye. You would have to change the launch point of each one of those arrows because they would all have different flight characteristics. That's literally what you're doing. That's why I titled the, 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 the presentation, which I did, The Vectors of Sports Performance. The, a vector is just that. Yeah. It's a flight path. So, if so, so what you do in, in that metaphor of using you know, assorted weighted arrows, if you think, okay, the arrow of maximal muscle mass is – this weight, this length, and then you go on past history and you're like, oh, I need to be 300 meters from the target. And then you go back 300 meters and you say, all right, that's where I'm going to launch that arrow. And then you go, all right, this other arrow is, you know, ideal, you know, 
body fat composition. Oh, fuck. That's a, that's a much lighter arrow. I need to put that one all the way back at 800 meters. And then, so now you have differing launch points for each of these training concepts Got it. so that they all converge on one bullseye. Oh, look, can we give the example? Start everything at the same time and expect the ball to play out properly. Right. You want to build one characteristic, reverse engineer that, but can we give the example of just maximal muscle hypertrophy? What is the arrow that you would use to build that foundation? Well, see, here's the thing. Now you're into the uh, what I would generously define as a quasi-sport because you're, what you're talking about is bodybuilding. Okay. It's not really a sport. Ultimately, a sport culminates in some sort of sporting event. Bodybuilding is at best a pageant. So what we'll talk about is like dead off-season hypertrophy for the sake of some sport. We're, we're hypertrophy because we want to be a better powerlifter or a better football player yep. or a better rugby player or whatever. Sure. So now it doesn't the, – the question you asked actually kind of becomes a different question. The first question is, how much time do you have to devote to that? Because most athletes have other concerns. They need to be in a certain weight and condition and flexibility, mobility at the initiation of a season. So they may not have an unlimited supply of this precious stuff called time. You know, so that's a huge characteristic, a, you know, consideration in determining this. Then I would say, once you determine how much time you have, I would say, what is the, the minimal and maximal expression of that trait? How quickly could you possibly do it? And at what point will you begin to run into fatigue-based problems where it's no longer accumulating? That answer happens to live somewhere between 8 and 16 weeks most of the time. So now you've got an answer that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work based on your other considerations in your athletic life. Do you have a preference of whether you'd like to begin with getting someone really strong first or getting someone like really volumized and uh, just getting the muscle cell quite large first? To what sport? You, again, you know, the, the, the latter would have zero of application for a 100-meter sprinter. However, if we're talking about a rugby player who's looking at you know, potentially you know, needing to be a, a center or something, size is probably more relevant than any of the other traits. So we bring them to size, and then we slowly teach that size conditioning and fitness and sports utility. So again, it's, it's very dependent on what's the ultimate outcome. Yeah. And this is why people fail is because they don't think about the ultimate outcome before they just engage in willy-nilly fucking action. Got it. Makes complete sense. So in the now thinking about you're, you're, you're in the plan and program, you're progressively overloading every whatever, week, whatever. How do you consider progressively overloading with volume versus mechanical load. And this conversation obviously changes whether you're enhanced or not enhanced, your area of expertise being enhanced. How do you consider volume and load as progressive overload uh, strings to pull? Well, again, it depends largely on what is the fucking outcome. If your goal is being stronger than the intensity, which by the way, that's the correct word. The load on the bar is the coin in which you're going to get paid. So obviously that's the coin in which you want to accumulate. Whereas if hypertrophy size and, and just taking up space is the goal, that's not a load driven concept. That's largely a volume driven concept. Load is a factor of volume, volume being load time sets times reps or load time reps and sets. Um, but that's three variables in one equation. So these people that think that only adding weight to the bar is the only measure of progression is literally one, two thirds wrong. Mm. They're, they're literally only one third correct because it is by definition a three variable and that's discounting frequency, which could be considered a fourth variable. So again, it, it, it all comes down to the outcome, but 
I realize that I understand the question you're actually asking in the background, and I'll I'll give you an answer that's a bit more satisfying. Typically, the way I would do it, especially in a hypertrophy-driven concept, yep. would be progress volume first. Let's say a relatively speaking fixed load, 65, 70% of one arm, maybe. And we systematically add reps and or sets to expand the volume at a relatively fixed load for a period of time. So the expansion is in volume. And then at some point we do the Israelian deload, which I think is a horrifically bad word. I would call it a reset. We reset to the original volume. We escalate the load and then perform a similar progression of volume. So we get this sawtooth volume, 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 a little more load, volume, 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 a little more load. So we've got one sawtooth, which is very low amplitude of escalation of load, and then a much larger sawtooth that is an escalation and amplitude of volume. Okay. And then within that progressive overload with volume, what is the rate, the interval of the rate of overload that you like to stick within for hypertrophy? Typically, I I actually have no. I'm good. This is the one place where I'm not going to dodge you. I actually have an answer. Um, <laughs> but relatively speaking, and this is mildly malleable, but in general, progressing from about eighty weekly working sets up to about 120 weekly working sets. Do you, in over what time time period? There's many different models. The time period is ultimately determined by the periodization, oh. which is determined by okay. either the availability of time to the athlete or the tolerance to drugs. But let's say 16 weeks yep. is the pharmacological periodization of which we're going to do. Now we've got an assortment of possibilities. We've got a monolithic steady state escalation from 80 to 120 over 16 weeks, or maybe we go 80 to 120 in eight and then back to 80 and back to 120 in the final eight. Got it. Okay. So almost like a, like a up-down model flipping it. Um, do you, have you heard of Craig as volume landmarks? Of course. Okay, great. So Generally, you know, pretty well regarded, pretty confident that these volume landmarks approximately work for most people. Uh, mm -hmm. How much do you unleash the cap of that, that 80 to 120 work sets per week for your enhanced athletes who can handle more volume and it may necessitate it to stimulate or to, to drive a greater stimulus for adaptation and growth? Well, A, I do have athletes that wildly exceed that 80 to 120. How However, much? oh, I, I have IFBB pros that, that triple that. No exaggeration. They're very rare outliers. Yeah, okay. Here's the, here's the thing with any training paradigm, whether it's high-intensity, low-volume training, or a traditional you know, five by five, or it's my version of... 80 to 120. Ultimately, all of them are relatively speaking arbitrary in that you have to set some manner of parameter. There, there just has to be something. You, I'm going to do three sets of 10 or five sets of five or something. It, it has to be some framework that's coherent. So I'm completely open to the possibility that there are loads of other ways. See what I did there with loads? That's funny. Uh, there are loads of other ways to get progressive overload and generate stimulus and all these things. I, I'm completely aware of that. But what I choose to do is anchor the framework as this progression in volume. Now, with that anchored, you have complete freedom to manipulate escalations in load as needed. So if that framework of volume is particularly easy to you, you have more available energies to escalate load within that framework. Got it. 
Whereas if volume is particularly high, you have less flexibility to manipulate load. Maybe in that case, that's the parameter you change instead, volume or, or even uh, reps, Correct. one rep and per week. Correct. So again, at some point, that's the thing that I don't think most people are honest about is at some point you must make an arbitrary framework that is anchored to reality and then build your coherence upon it. To the best of my knowledge, none of the Greek gods have come to earth and said, thou shalt progress X. And anyone who's not doing that is wrong. To the best of my understanding, that's not happened. So all of us are just grasping at some anchorable point or framework that we recognize as playing out to some statistical value in reality. So in that case, maybe it doesn't matter as much what you pick but just that you pick something, commit to it, and kind of commit to that process of change instead of trying to find the perfect process in of itself? Well, of course. Um, uh, again, I, 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 again, that, that, that's exactly what that means. It can't mean anything else. Yep. Now, it does mean a couple of interesting things under the hood. Each one of those models is going to have pluses and minuses in terms of orthopedic stresses, yep. metabolic stresses, et cetera. You're going to have to deal with those. It just so happens that I believe my model offers the most long-term survivability. Doesn't mean I'm right, but that is part of my premise. By escalating volume, worst case, you're uh, exposed to overuse injuries, not sheer load injuries mm. like you know, corn and muscles and broken bones, which can in fact happen in very high load, high effort modalities see Dorian Yates, et cetera, et cetera, fuck, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and again, I will point out an interesting, I, I love quotes, especially when they're good. Um, I, I'm guessing you are familiar, at least passingly, with the name Arthur Jones. Yes. The creator or progenitor of Nautilus equipment and basically all that really is well and truly high intensity, um, who was the quintessential, if not ultimate progenitor of low volume training actually said volume in fact is everything because without it you're not training okay so you, if need you have no volume you have no workout of course you need some you need something right I, I understood but if you stop and internalize what that means it means exactly what you just said ultimately it doesn't really matter what your model is as long as you work coherently within your model Meaning the volume is, okay, right. Yeah, and volume is the underpinning of that. And do you then, because we still need a, uh, a monicum of strength, relative strength uh, to... Why? Hey? Why? Wait, so you do you believe that... No, no I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just asking you. That, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to say out loud, but what's the... What, what, what's the you know, logical underpinnings of that statement. Why? Okay. Well, if you don't have something to begin with, perhaps you can't express it. For example, particular if you don't have strength to begin with, it's very hard to express power and speed. It's like you have like shit all of nothing. You're not going to be able to express but, power but, and speed to a higher extent. But in a, in a hypertrophy concept, what value does that have? Well, that's the conversation I wanted to ask. So, okay. Well, let, let me answer the question you didn't answer. This is why strength has value, okay? Volume is load times reps times, times set. You've got three variables in an algebraic equation that equals these three variables equals volume. So you increase your so capacity to drive a higher mechanical stimulus through greater strength. Right. So you have three options to add volume. If this is the V over here, you have three variables in which can express greater volume, one of them be strength. So in that sawtooth concept that I laid out, the reason load is very slowly and incrementally increasing is because it does go back into the equation and raises the starting volume. The same number of reps and same number of sets is of a greater volume because of a zero to 5% increase in load. And then that is then logarithmically expressed mm. over the escalation of volume. So therefore, the increase in strength 
justifies itself because you can increase in total volume. Correct. Okay. So there's the. So the comedy is all of these people that are so desperately concerned about linear periodization and linear progression and load don't realize they're actually just very inefficiently increasing volume through only load. Through through only load. Yes. Got it. Okay. It must suck to be stupid. It must really be fucking painful. What? Well, that's why we're. Co- that's the frustration, right? That we talked about earlier. Just fucking sucking and not knowing shit. Constantly <laughs> wanting to know more. What do you think talking to you, Broderick, makes me feel? That's why we're here. So. Um, okay. That's a level. That's a level of sarcasm you didn't deserve. I apologize. <laughs> it's humbling, Broderick. We all need it. Uh, but okay. Volume, progressive overload. Now, if we were to think about designing the biggest, strongest human being that ever lived, superhuman, right? Okay. What performance enhancing drugs would you specifically give them? And what dosages, if you're comfortable sharing? Like, how do you design that program? Well, I mean, I'd like to think I've been complicit in designing that program because there there are some pretty goddamn exceptional people walking this planet, and I've had my hands under the hood, you know, in in many of them. Um, th- th- here's here's the disappointing, honest answer to that: it's not a single recipe. Drugs fix problems, not unlike exercises. For instance, if you had the best trainer in the world and he wrote you the best, most appropriate program to you and your goals. There would be a series of exercises, but they would be specific to you. That may not be the perfect recipe of exercises and ordering of exercises for me or for your training partner or you know your neighbor, because you have a given starting point that has certain strengths and weaknesses just mechanically, orthopedically, genetically, you origins and insertions, limb lengths, all of that shit is yours. Drugs are not unlike that. You have a series of strengths and deficiencies in a, in a performance profile. And the things, the, the holes that need to be plugged are not the same in any two people. So the drug recipe will very much be determined by the the the, the 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 picture is very much determined by the the canvas in which you're painting it on got it context matters it does i again people have asked me that you know they they will send me a cycle they're like this is what i'm taking what do you think and i'm like you have no idea what are you making i'm like what 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 is the what is the goal of this what are, what are you trying to create with this i have seen world class bodybuilders world class powerlifters who have very, very shockingly similar drug protocols, yet the outcomes are wildly different. But in context of the starting material, those tools get them to their particular endpoint. So then how does one determine the ideal uh, dose-response relationship of anabolics? Well, the dose response is much different than compound selection. Dose response, typically, as childlike and bro sciencey as this works, the general answer there is more, more almost universally works more. more. More does more. So now it's really a function of what's the minimum effective dose to get the outcome in which you seek. And on that pantheon, typically raising the dose raises the effect as well as the potential side effects. Until what point is, I mean, I don't know. At what point is there a point of diminishing returns? See, again, bad question. uh, No, no, of course we know. Again, we, we, pharmacology is a hundred plus years old. We know the, the point of diminishing returns is actually almost immediately. Literally. When we know this in antibiotics, the, 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 the point of diminishing returns is almost immediately, but we also know that there's a dosage threshold necessary to accomplish the goal. Just because you take 500 milligrams of amoxicillin three times a day doesn't mean that that's somehow a, you know, an idealized dose or it's the perfect, it, it's simply the dose that you must tolerate to accomplish the goal, which is tamping down 
the bacterial proliferation. But we actually know on a milligram to kilogram ratio, we know one milligram actually works better. But it's also not strong enough to accomplish the goal, so that answer is irrelevant. Say that one more time, that last, that last bit. It, it is well understood that every time you double the dose, you actually lower the efficiency. So two milligrams works less effectively than one milligram. And four milligrams works less effectively than two. But four milligrams is not enough to accomplish the goal. So that concept means nothing. Got it. It's irrelevant. You need 500 milligrams every eight hours to accomplish the goal of retarding bacterial proliferation. So that's the answer. The answer is that's the amount needed to accomplish the goal, not to maximize efficiency, because the maximal efficiency is at such a low range, it amounts to dick. Would you, I mean, I wouldn't even call, I don't know if I would even call, oh, I get it. Yeah, I get how you're defining efficiency now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there's going to be very context driven and how the individual responds, which is, I don't know if you see commonalities between dose stimulus responses uh, of anabolics, um, or do, do you just see a, a wide swath of variability in the response? There is a wide swath of variability in response, but there are certain commonalities that crop up what do you um, um, ethnic you, ethnicity driven, those sorts of things. Um, you, you definitely get a feel even to the point where like, almost like the old time simotyping, when you look at a body type, you're like, Oh yeah, I, I know what's coming here. And you kind of move in a direction based on just their general presentation. That that's a real thing. But even within that, that's more usually about drug selection than drug than dosing. But even within that commonality, there's still a wide distribution of, of drug response. Right. Uh, and also, by the way, people always say drug response like it's a monolithic thing. I would also second that with and drug tolerance. Drug tolerance is probably the biggest mover in success above drug response because if your tolerance is infinite you can just keep throwing drugs at it until you get to your goal if your drug tolerance is limited well then you're limited would you use the analogy of like caffeine some people being fast low caffeine metabolizers dependent on their genetics could that have a same um, genetic implication for drug tolerance well absolutely but in the in the case of anabolics it's really not about like say specific metabolism it's more about just the general robustness or durability in, in t tolerating the stress of drugs. Got it. Speaking of stress or tolerance, it, when we talk about the stimulus to recovery adaptation principle, uh, how, how do you practically consider that with your enhanced athletes, knowing that they can drive a much greater stimulus that's also the point of these anabolics is so we can do that and recover faster. Maybe even, I know you don't like talking about it, but versus an, the natural individual, but at least in the principle or the consideration of the enhanced individual considering the stimulus to recovery adaptation. How do you consider that? I, it, it goes up in a wildly parabolic curve. I, I wouldn't have the slightest ability to compare it, uh, but it, it, it goes up staggeringly. Um, you know, again, just by, by, by way of simple and basically verifiable comparison, ask any enhanced athlete of any, of any acumen, I suppose, when's the last time they've been sore? Hmm. The, the answer is almost universally zero, never, like not in, you know, not in 20 years. Like I, I can do 10 sets of 10 in a high bar squat literally on the final set collapse on the floor unable to stand 20 minutes later i'm recovered and i'm not sore for ever after that i'm 50 fucking years old like that the, there's there's again i i don't even know if that is quantifiable but it's just by by definition it's staggering really lifts the roof off the potential of what you can handle so i yeah. think that's enough to be said by orders of magnitude is probably the answer. Um, yeah. Now I want to be conscious of your time, Broderick. Are you okay? 
to keep I am. chatting. I am for a bit. Okay. Well, we'll close the conversation soon. But um, you brought up uh, CRISPR technology, gene editing, just very briefly on a podcast. And I thought with your background in biology and you know total human enhancement, this is a very fascinating subject to me. I wonder just your general thoughts on unleashing the potential to perform well beyond our current capabilities um, with CRISPR technology. Like, how do you feel about that? What do you think about CRISPR? And like, is that something you would consider for yourself if you're at the tail end of your life and you're like, yep, I'm going to drop 50 grand to, you know, add another five, 10, whatever years to my life? Um, no, I have zero interest in adding years to my life. I'm, I'm well and truly over life. Over life. Um, no, oh yeah, hundred percent. I have zero. I'm, I'm, there's no way I would All right. pony up for more of this shit. Quality of no. life then. Um, again, I'm fucking awesome. Like where, where, where are you, where are, you, where, where are we going from here? Like, I don't fucking understand that question either. Um, it's more philosophical I mean, in the sense, you know, just playing around with curious thoughts. I, again, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't even like answering questions like that because I sound like an asshole. But I'm 50 years old. I got a fucking 700 pound squat, a 400 pound bench press. I fuck like a jackhammer. Like, where, where are we going? What's the upside from this point? I don't really, I can't even conceptualize what that means. Like, more quality of life. Like the the things that I'm cognitively cogent. You know, I, I fucking get more erections than I want. Like, where, where, what, what's the what is the thing that you're adding to my person that's that's that valuable? I don't. I, again, I just can't. I can't internalize that as a question. Well, um, even just the things we see, like in fantasy movies, sci-fi movies, of just where the direction of human evolution seems to be going, being autonomous with robotics, etc. Well, what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll, I'll entertain this by answering a different question, but maybe it's relevant. Um, I, I am actually privy to a lot of information that Gen Pop clearly doesn't know, and even the above, you know, above average average asshole doesn't know. Um, there is genetic alterations taking place now. It, it is happening. Um, we we as a society, we like I'm doing it. No, there, the scientific community possesses the ability hmm. to, much like coronavirus, insert much like the, the vaccine, literally, to insert genetic information into people to intentionally express RNA, mRNA, or DNA to cell nucleus. We, we have that technology. It's relatively fact. Um, there are entities out there using that very technology, let's say mRNA technology, to convince cells, cell nucleus, to transmit via cyclic AMP, the you know, pr protein expressive recipe or blueprint, if you will, for things like insulin and growth hormone. It's happening now. Also for transmutation of cell fiber, uh, muscle fiber type from type one to type X and et cetera. So that's happening now. So to some degree, this is almost an argument taking place outside of reality because the reality is, going on now mm. will in the not terribly distant future we have will we have the ability to do these things on the zygote level so that people are able to develop you know with these traits yes no we're not there to my knowledge but yes we will have that and how do i feel about that i think it's awesome i think it's amazing and wonderful i think it's no different than the polio vaccine it's a, a biological you know biomedical step forward I think it's wonderful. Okay. Great. Well, probably the last, one of the last things I wanted to, well, last couple of questions, Brodbeck, I wanted to bring up and just get your uh, two cents on. Um, these are, I think they're plant steroids. Like, I don't know if I'm not even known, but I'm saying the word right. Uh, ectosteroids. Are you familiar with them? Do you recommend them? I am. No, absolutely not. Um, what's the per what's the mechanism behind their effective uh, effectiveness to increasing protein synthesis and skeletal muscle mass? Um, well, again, I don't want to say zero because that's never the correct answer. But most hormones are, if not species specific, they're certainly phylum and genus specific. Okay, 
testosterone happens to work in almost all higher mammals. It's one of the, dare I say, universal ones. But many hormones within humans, for instance, a growth hormone and insulin, do not work in other animals, other, even other primates. Growth hormone, for, as a matter of fact, is very species specific. You could take the growth hormone from even a chimp or an orangutan, which are within, what, 4% of us genetically, and it does not work. They're very specific. So right out of the gate, the question you need to ask is, what are these hormones native to? And the answer is insects and plants, mm. which you are fucking not. Therefore, the relevance is very suspicious and tenuous. And dare I say, if they had any efficacy, it would probably be largely in an unintended fashion, not in a, the attended fashion. Like, for instance, they might be susceptible. They might not operate on the target tissue like an anabolic should, but they might be, say, susceptible to the aromatase enzyme and create viable estrogen, which happens to be the case in the one you mentioned. But it's just an interesting Example. So again, if you're going to take a hormone, why not take the one relevant to your fucking species? Why, why would you? Why would you do that sort of weird bestiality crossover fucking dance that for for no real reason? I think people are under the impression that they don't want to go because there's a stigma of testosterone and anabolic steroids, right? And they don't want to go full yeah. ball there yet. Um, and they want okay. to play around with these kind of plant steroids to curb some of the side effects. But then they also get uh, kind of nominal gains as well. So I think that's why some people think about it and do it. Okay. I mean, I accept that as an answer. I, it doesn't make any sense to me, nor can I sign off on it. But I, I'll, I'll accept your assessment of humanity and I'll, I'll accept that answer, but it's still dumb. I mean, she's just fucking, still fucking stupid. Done. Um, if you could give three books, I don't know if you read uh, or if you have <laughs> education pieces. I'm sure you do, Broderick. Some people love listening to shit. So the answer is yes. That's a giant bookcase for those just listening. Broderick fucking reads. Now, out of those that bookcase, three- By the books, way, that's just nonfiction. The fiction's over there. But oh, anyway, you read like do you have a favorite kind of fiction, fantasy. Oh, I don't know what, what type of fiction you read. Um. Oh well, the, my education. I but one of the one of the first books I ever read was the Iliad. So it, it starts there. Um. You know, read you know Homer, Dante, the Bible, the Koran, the Mahabharata, um, which I put in the fiction category. Um. Dune, mm. probably my absolute favorite work of all time is uh, Hyperion. What's um, for those who don't but, know, what's Hyperion? Uh, it's science fiction, but it's really not science fiction. It's really cultural satire guys did in science fiction. Okay. And if we go to the nonfiction category now, you know, if you were to give three books to, you know, every... A graduating high schooler, you know, 18 years old, very impressionable and moldable. What do you give them? Hanselier's Stress of Life. The original under Dan Duchesne Underground Anabolic Steroid Handbook. Dr. Fred Hatfield's A Scientific Approach to Power. Got it. Or maybe super training. That last one, I would I would flip between those two, depending. Okay. They're very similar. Is there one single book that has had the most, or one single person that has had the most impressionable impact on you over your life? I'd like to say no. I'd like to say I took in bits and pieces from here, there, and everywhere. Um, honestly, I, I'm, I'm kind of going to dodge the question, but I'm kind of not. Honestly, I am the sort of person that more learns from environments than individuals. Okay. And there have been environments that were very, very useful to my development. 
um, the environment of being around Mark Chalet, Dr. Fred Hatfield, you know, Kirk Parwoski, that, that environment did the most for me on a developmental level. In those environments, has there been a biggest mistake or point of frustration that we were talking about earlier that you attribute to a lot of your current growth? Um, yeah, frustration is not the right word. I would, I would use the word disappointment. disappointment. My, my, my greatest learning moment was coming to grips with the disappointment that is um, the Amer- or at least when I experienced it, the American university experience. I was wildly, wildly disappointed. I grew up in a small industrial town. Uh, my grandparents raised me. They were um, very, very old world. I grew up in the 1970s and I lived like it was the 1940s. Seriously. Um, and I had this, I built up this fantastical and frankly wrong mental construct that when I went off to university, I was going to be surrounded by these enlightened, open, generous people that were, there's just going to be this constant flow and transfer of ideas and thoughts. And it was going to be this idyllic, you know, Greek thing. And it wasn't, it was self-righteous and dignant twats that had no regard for me whatsoever. And actually, despised me because I had the time and effort to question that they may not be completely correct. And it was a disaster. And that was the greatest disappointment. And it basically fueled everything that came after because I just, you know, you just, you ever, you ever just walk into the wrong bar and you're just like, Oh fuck, this is the wrongest place I've ever been. I, I have to leave. Like mm. yet I was trapped for three and a half years. Like, you, you just, can you imagine that? Like, it sounds like a version of hell that you really despised. I, I, you, you have no idea the level of, 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 of angst and loathing. I, I'm confident that every single student thought I was a, a meth addict because I literally sat in the back of the class, gripping the edge of the desk with it, with it, with a, forceful death grip just sweating just in my mind just hating the people in front of me just hating them just literally envisioning like a rain of white hot hate just splashing off of their face like a bad german porn i just hated them in a way that's almost indescribable yet you stayed in there yet you continued you could have got that education elsewhere yeah, you stay. Yeah, but here's the here's the tragic part. As smart as I am, I didn't realize that at the time. If I knew, I could have just went to the library and found books in a quiet, peaceful, coffee-rich environment. I certainly would have fucking done that. But I was literally just a bit too ignorant to realize that at the time. Wow. I was convinced by culture and adults and other you know unenlightened sources that those people were the gatekeepers to higher knowledge. Right. Who is the gatekeeper now? Is there a gatekeeper? You. Yeah, yeah, you. Having the fucking motivation to ask Siri. Literally, literally information abounds. Motivation is the missing factor today. Like to do this, to want to speak to more people, educate yourself, ask questions, be willing to look stupid. Yeah, I mean, once upon I mean, again, like I, I don't want to romanticize or 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 anything, but you know, again, I grew up in the 1970s. I turned, you know, of age in the early 80s. You know, uh, you know, when I wanted information on on anabolic steroids, or for that matter, even wanted anabolic steroids. I had to get a paper document and unfold it and plot a course, a physical course to another land where the people and the drugs might mythically exist. And I had to fucking go there on buses and airplanes and hitchhiking to go to a place to maybe find a person that maybe 
knew something about or possessed the thing that I was interested in. Like, that's the world I grew up in. At, at, at 16 years old, I got on a 747 and flew to the opposite coast, unaccompanied, to, to lift weights and talk to people about lifting weights. Because that's where they fucking were. Now you can talk to somebody on a device in your pocket. What do you think? Like, but that it has its value, though. Because now we can all interconnect and learn from each other. No, I mean, this is wonderful. This is, this is the greatest thing ever. The problem is people are too fucking lazy to apply it. Right. So then what advice, maybe you just said it, but what advice do you have for young people? People Get your head out of your ass and get on with it. But what does that mean for them, practically? The, <laughs> make a list of questions. Yep. Make a list of people that might have answers and fucking harangue them until they answer you or disappoint you. Well, and then make a list and move on. Well, thank you, Broderick, because I feel like we have done that and we are doing that right now. Lastly, I've harangued the shit out of you here to your uh, frustration or uh, maybe delight. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the greatest mental, physical feat you have ever seen in your life? Probably the answer I give you probably depends on the day you ask me. Okay. But watching Fred Hadfield squat a thousand pounds was possibly that. Watching Tom Platt's train on any random day was possibly that. But honestly, I never got to meet the man, but I've studied him watching Richard Feynman think mm. to the point of breaking into a sweat is possibly the most fundamentally baffling thing I've ever seen. You've spoke about Richard Feynman many times. Thinking with such intensity that he physically broke into a sweat is mind, mind bending. What characteristic of him do you value the highest? He had a thing, and I, I don't, I don't, I, I literally, speaking of, we started this conversation talking about language. Yeah. I lack the language to exactly define it. It is quite literally a je ne sais quoi that li lies somewhere between arrogance indignation and a, and a childlike curiosity that he possessed almost singularly.